back to you as well. Uh, I'm very pleased to announce uh, our next speaker, to introduce our next speaker, Rhonda Fasil. Um, she is the Vice President, Partnerships and Development at CDISC, that's those FDA data standards that Sophia just shared about. Uh, and her presentation is called CDISC and How Data Standards Can Help Drive Development of Mito Treatments. To you, Rhonda. Thank you, Danielle. Let me just share my screen. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Great. Well, thank you, Sophia and um, the Mito crew for inviting me to present to you today. It is amazing what's been accomplished in one year, so hats off for that. Um, and just so you know, CDISC is very pleased to support and partner with Cure Mito as they move forward um, with their very important work. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about CDISC and then how standards can help drive development of treatments. So I'm gonna give you a quick overview. You've already introduced me. I've been with CDISC for a long time, 15 years. Prior to that, I have experience from the pharmaceutical industry and regulatory affairs and clin ops. Um, so I've been at this for a little while. Um, so I'm going to just start with what is CDISC. Uh, some of you might know very well, like I recognize Parag from long ago, and I know that he knows very well what CDISC is. But so pardon me if this is repetitive for, for some of you, but CDISC is a global standards development organization. It was founded in 97 by volunteers, and today it's a 5013C nonprofit organization. We have over 40 employees. We're soon to hit the 50 soon, and we have over 100 contractors. Um, also working with us is a hundred, uh, a thousand volunteers all over the world, um, and we um, develop training both online and virtual, um, online in classroom rather for most of the standards. CDISC uh, has 545 members. That's the primary source of funding for CDISC is the membership, um, but it's also a little bit from events uh, and a little bit from education to kind of keep the, the the lights on and the doors open. Um, as an SDO, it's really important that CDISC reach out and work with different groups in order to, um, to push forward not only data, st data standards, but also helping to push the science forward and making sure that the data is clear and can be used by multiple different stakeholders. So this slide just summarizes some of the areas where we have um, alliances and collaborations or partnerships. The first one there on the left is, is therapeutic area standards, and we've been working for years with CPATH which was mentioned earlier, a great organization. We have been working with them for, as I said, many, many years. Um, and together with them and various other stakeholders, we've developed about 45 therapeutic area standards. And what those are is they build upon foundational standards, which is those kind of concepts that you see regardless of whether or not you're visiting your physician for a, um, a, a checkup, a clinical encounter, or, um, or you're in a clinical trial. And that would be those things like Sophia listed on the list on her presentation, demographics, medical history, um, medications, um, things of that sort that are collected at every encounter. And so what we do with the therapeutic area standards is we layer, layer over that therapeutic area concept so that we can give um, investigators a more complete package of standards um, for the area that they are doing their clinical trial. Um, on the right there, you have the regulatory collaborations, and Sophia mentioned this as well, and I'll talk a little bit more about it later, but primarily it's FDA who requires the use of SDTM, ADAM, and defined XML, um, PMDA. Um, we also work with EMA, um, and we have some collaboration with the Chinese NMPA. Um, on the bottom there, it's the world of standards development organizations that CDISC is active in. So we work um, a lot with the with ISO, the International Standards Organization, IHE, ICH, HL7, which is the healthcare um, standards organization, um, as well as the folks that develop the OMOP model, the Odyssey Group, DICOM, GS1, um, and others. It's just a, just a few of some of the, the larger ones that we um, collaborate with. On the bottom there is FUSE, and that's a group that looks at analysis and implementation issues, um, and so we work very closely with them as well. On the right is sort of a different set of, of collaborators, um, you know, and I'll speak about this later in my presentation, but as we get to a world where we are leveraging real-world data in order to generate real-world evidence, that requires working with academics and some of the folks that are on this call and trying to look at how do we make the CETIS standards um, easier to implement so that they can be used earlier in the research process, not at the end 
when um, when there's a submission to be completed. Um, Sophia um, mentioned CDASH, and that's the data collection standard. So the idea is, is to collect it in a standard format, um, and then then you have it there, and you can convert it to SDTM at you know later, and it goes much quicker because there's about a 75 to 80 percent overlap between those standards. Um, so we're working with academic institutions. Um, and one of the things I'm going to highlight later is a collaboration with Open Clinic and REDCap, where, where we are making the standards um, available in those platforms because that's those are platforms that academics use heavily. Um, so a little bit more about CDISC. I mentioned we're a consensus-based standards development organization, and the standards can be used for clinical and translational research. And all of our standards are freely available on CDISC.org, all of them. Um, so I want to make sure everybody knows that um, we, we don't try to charge for those standards at all. Um, and actually, last week, we made CDIS Library open and free, which is a repository of all the standards. So anyone can go in, create an account, and, and be able to access and download standards and, and um, suck them into their system and utilize them right off the bat via CDIS Library. And we have an IP policy that ensures that those standards stay open <clears throat> forever. Um, you know, globally, we have ongoing research support in the Americas, Europe, Japan, China, India, Korea, and other regions, and it seems to be growing um, year by year. And our standards supporting documents are available in English, Chinese, Ch Japanese, and Chinese. So a little bit about regulation, just following on what we spoke about earlier. Um, what this diagram shows you is the diagrams on the left, the, the documents in the blue field on the left, those are the FDA um, documents that created the obligation to use CETA standards and regulatory submission. In the middle, you have the um, FDA um, Steady Data Technical Conformance Guide, which is instruction on how to use those standards. And on the right there is a screenshot from the PMDA that describes the same. Um, so as I mentioned, they're required in FDA um, in, here in the United States and in Japan, um, but they're recognized um, for submissions by the Chinese and MPA. And increasingly, EMA is more interested in, 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 in data, both getting data in for the real world data issue that I mentioned. Um, and also they can ask um, for data if they have questions in their review process. And when they do, they don't object to getting it in, in CDIS format. So a little bit about governance. One of the key important things about an SDO is that you have a, a, a solid governance process to, that ensures that, um, that everyone doesn't have to agree, but at least you're able to reach a consensus and that you um, take on the comments and objectives, and consider them, and you use fair, impartial, and open, transparent processes to develop the standards. And this is you know, an FDA requirement that they, they would not be able to advocate standards were it not um, for um, a, a good governance process. So on the bottom there, it's a rather simple, straightforward um, governance process that involves you know, scoping and planning, identifying the, conce the, the, the concepts that are gonna be in focus, developing the standard. Then there's an internal and a public review, and those are really important. Um, with the internal review, the idea here is not to develop standards that A, already exist or would be um, in conflict with current standards. So that's a really important step. And the next one is a public review, which is you know, 60 days in, in duration and anybody anywhere um, is welcome to comment on standards. In between each of these steps is a governance group that meets to ensure those things that I just described, that we're not developing standards that are elsewhere or in conflict with um, existing CETA standards. And so when we talk about standards, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about um, this end-to-end -end process. And this is where the CETA standards are. Um, and so they start on the left there with, pre with preclinical, which is animal data. And then from there, um, we have a protocol representation model. Um, and then we have CDASH, which is the data collection model or the case report form um, standards. Um, and then you have the organization part or the tabulate part, which is SDTM. And I apologize. I know this is acronym soup. It'll be over soon, but that means the study data tabulation model. And then next you have analysis and we have the model for that. And then once you've gone through all of that, um, hopefully you can submit your or publish your report. But in between each of these stages, we have the data exchange standards and those are in between, um, in between the bars as you see going across there, ODM XML, define data set XML, SDM XML. Um, and so I mentioned before, those are the what we call the foundational standards, then layering over top, those are the therapeutic area user guides. And then underpinning all of that is 
CETUS controlled terminology um, and the CETUS glossary. There's also a mention there for bridge and that's a, an overarching information model that's maintained by um, NIH, ISO, CDISC, um, and NCI. Um, so it's really important that the terms, the definitions are, are really important in standards. So what do the standards do? I showed you what they are, is, is it, they provide a common structure in a terminology, what I just mentioned. And in that way, the data can be collected, it can be aggre aggregated, it can be analyzed, and then it could be shared. It could be transferred from one group to another. The other big thing that standards do, that's the requirement. I think it's part 11 requirement um, to submit um, um, data to FDA is this end-to-end um, -end traceability requirement that you should be able to go from protocol um, and then translate that into what does it look like on the case report form? What does the collected data look like? What do normalized um, data tabulations, um, what do they look like? How can you, you know, visualize the data moving through this process? Then you have analysis and analysis results. So theoretically, you could go that way and then backwards and have that complete traceability all the way back um, to the case report form and to the protocol. And so that's the function that CETA standards provide. So what is the problem that CETIS um, seeks to address? It's this unnecessary variability at collection. And what you see in front of you is four different case report forms. Um, they're all collecting sex, which is relatively um, straightforward, at least for the terms that are used here. Um, and what you see is the red boxes here. You see M and F for male and female. You see it on the bottom there, one male, two female in parentheses. Um, you see male and female spelled out. You see male also with a zero with a zero in front of it and female with a one. Um, and so all of these are different, which means that when you get to the data set, it's a mess. Um, and so this is the other part of the problem. If you collect the data in an unstandard way, you're gonna get that same variability when you look at the tabulated data. And so in this case, you could see each of these, of these, um, um, these data set names are different. So you're gonna have a tough time without spending a lot of time going down and going through the data to figure out that these are actually um, the same data set. And then looking at the actual table here, where you got subj ID here, you have sex here, but this one says ID and gender. Each of these is somewhat different. And then the data itself, is it three zeros and a one? Is it A1? Is it M? Is it male? You get the idea. Um, and this is a very simple example, but when you look at large amounts of complex medical data, this is a nightmare to sort out. So this is basically the use case for clinical data standards. So now I'll switch and talk to you about CDISC RWD activities. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of interest in how to leverage real world data um, to generate evidence. I mean, all of the regulatory authorities are, are looking at this. They're kicking off large projects to try to analyze it and figure out the best way to do this. And what this shows here is, is, is some of the different documents that have been generated um, around real world data. Um, but it's true is that they want to use it. They want to use high quality RWD in decision making. And this is why I think um, um, Cure Mido's four site in their, um, their registry database to go ahead and make the leap and use standards now, because that way it will facilitate um, the acceptance of that data later on downstream to the regulatory authorities. I think it's super smart. Um, and indeed, recently, FDA just uh, issued these draft um, RWD and, and registry data guidances, and they pretty much point to the use of CETA standards for this purpose. Um, so CDISC also is looking at real world data, and I mentioned earlier about making things easier for academics. We conducted a large Delphi survey a couple of years ago, and we just published the paper earlier this year. And out of that, we received, we, we asked the community, what should CDISC do in order to make the standards easier to implement? You know, traditionally, um, the, you know, uh, the um, transcribing the data into CDIS usually happened at the end when the trial was over. It's called legacy data conversion. Um, and so um, that being the case, that's not something that academic investigators can really do. And that's not something we want people to do. We want them to use the standards at collection. Um, and so this paper was asking the community, well, what should CDIS do in order to achieve that goal? How do you, how do you get, um, get people to implement the standards who might not necessarily be an expert in CDIS standards nor want to be? We, don't want, we want investigators to focus on science and taking care of their patients not to necessarily be experts in, in the intricacies of SDTM. 
So, and here's some of the things that we, the advice that we were given and the projects that we're working on now um, to fulfill that goal. The first one is to create a basic SDTM implementation guide, which is just looking at those foundational domains. What is it, what would it, what would it look like to, for, a, for a person who doesn't know CETUS to actually implement the standards? This is a real mind shift um, within CETUS to think about this. Um, we're also looking at creating a basic study setup guide, potentially in collaboration with REDCap and Open Clinica. Um, we're also putting together a consideration document uh, for using SDTM for observational studies, and also you know, exploring mapping and collaborating with, um, with the OMOP um, group. Um, I mentioned the REDCap and Open Clinica um, um, C-CRFs, ECRFs with rules, so we will continue to work with them to expand that set of standards that now are available um, freely on both of those sites. Um, and also putting together a C-SDTM to SDTM guide. Once you, once you collect it, how do you take it the rest of the way into SDTM? And perhaps Parag will talk about that in his presentation. Um, we've also reached out to HL7 and we've done a fire to CDIS mapping. Um, and we're looking at expanding that. Actually, we're, we may have a potential project um, working with several academic investigators to do just that. Um, and then finally, putting together a brief overview of the CDISC model, the library, and QRS's questionnaires, ratings, and scales, just to make the standards a bit more accessible um, and easier to find and easier to understand for this group. So what resources are available now? Just really quickly, we have a knowledge base, and that knowledge base contains articles and various different resources that, um, that people can get to and hopefully get some of their questions answered. Um, we have an ECRF portal, and this is an example of a demographics case report form. And then here's um, um, articles that are in the knowledge base that also address some of the issues that we know occur a lot um, when people are trying to implement CETIS standards. And then finally, known issues. There are some things that we know are issues that we haven't um, dealt with or we don't have any solutions for them right now, but it's a good place to go to go, is my question one that, that uh, they know about or do I need to <clears throat> send them an email and make them aware of, a, of something that I've found. So hopefully they can go there and get some information as well. I've, I've already mentioned Red Cap and Open Clinica. I'm personally really excited about this. I think it's the right step forward um, and we'll continue to populate um, both of those platforms with, uh, with CDIS compliant case report forms moving forward. Yeah, this example of the demographics. And that's what I wanted to share with you today. Again, thank you for inviting me to present. I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thanks so much, Rhonda. I learned a lot. I'm really excited to dig into some of these resources that you shared and very interested in this red cap work too, but because um, I work with that awesome. a lot. So yeah, that's really exciting. Thank you. Uh,